yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got 26 people. Um, on behalf of IU Women in IT, welcome. We are so happy you guys decided to join us this afternoon. Um, IU Women in IT is the staff affiliate of the Center of Excellence for Women in Technology. We're a professional staff-led organization dedicated to the professional development of women in IT. Uh, my name is Coral. I'm IU WIT's communications and event planning intern. Um, I'm a senior at IU, so this topic for our session today really hits home for me, and I hope it does for other students as well. Um, we are so happy that you guys decided to join us this afternoon. During our 50 minutes together today, we are going to cover everything from networking to interviewing, applying for jobs, and everything in between. We're going to start with a panel with four accomplished women in IT, and then after that, It'll be open for Q&A and we would love for this to just turn into an organic conversation where anybody feels like they can ask questions, answer questions, share their experiences, positive or negative. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Our four panelists today are Chris Bezzi, Melanie Ebden, Ellen Pruitt, and Miriam Young. Uh, so to start us off, panelists, would you all briefly introduce yourselves? I guess I'll go first since my name was yep. there. Okay. Um, uh, Chris Buzzy, I am an alum of IU and um, an ex-employee, um, 17 years at Indiana University working there. And a lot of years, almost all of that was also going to school. <laughs> Not going to lie. <laughs> um, I currently am in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I work for Salesforce. I work in the IT um project management, I'm a scrum master. So um, agility and um, delivering products is, is my game. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Are we going alphabetically? <laughs> I can go next. You can go next. Good, Ellen, go. Hi, my name is Ellen Pruitt. I'm a Gary native and a um, alumna of IU. I graduated um, what in from what is now media the media school but originally it was telecommunications and design and production I uh, started at IU working in one of the student technology consulting groups and I was in it in about four or five different roles for over a course of nine years before I became a virtual app engineer working with the products uh, Citrix and doing virtualization. Uh, but in my previous role with the technology consulting, I did hiring um, and onboarding students um, every semester for that group. Want to go next, Miriam? Sure. I was going to wait for you. <laughs> yeah, I can go. <laughs> so my name is Miriam Young, and I have been working with IU for the, for the last nine years. I started in IU Northwest, and now I am working for IU Bloomington in UITS Central in the digital campus design and infrastructure. I lead the part of the infrastructure side, and um, yeah, I'm excited to be here with this, with all you ladies. Thank you. So I'm Melanie or Mel Ebden. Um, I work for UITS as well, and I've been working at IU for the past 12 years. Started out the cyclotron and then moved to, to UITS, and I'm, in, I'm the manager of Human Resources Management Systems, and that's just what it sounds like. We do HR benefits, payroll, recruiting, faculty promotion and tenure, just about everything to do with employees at IU. Um, my educational background is in biomedical engineering and uh, anthropology and math. So I took a windy road here, <laughs> but uh, last month will be my, well, it was my 30 year anniversary in IT. So <laughs> long career <laughs> so far. And that's me. All right. First question, and whoever, panelists, whoever wants to pop in and answer, feel free. If you don't have any comments, no big deal. Um, it can just flow how it flows. So question number one, do you all have any recommendations when it comes to looking for 
that first job in the STEM industry? You know, where are the jobs being posted? How do you hear about them? Where to look? Well, for me, I, I've got to put a plug in for some of the, even the student technology jobs. I don't know if there are students here who are uh, not seniors. If you are not seniors, I would uh, definitely recommend looking at jobs in UITS. I know a lot of them do posting in the KB of just talking about their general job opportunities. So you've got technology center consulting and you've got um, you've got senior jobs um, uh, and jobs at IU. Yes. Yeah, no, there you. you go. <laughs> All right. Plug for me. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so yes, uh, I would say start there. I know um, uh, Chris uh, mentioned in our last um, uh, inf no, I'm not going to steal Chris's thunder, but I, I, I wanted to talk about your daughter, Amanda, because there's uh, a lot of those consulting jobs that we have at IU help create a really great portfolio when you uh, go to places. We had a, a Kronos um, do a lot of hiring from um, that student technology group that I was a part of. So I'd say start at IU, start creating your portfolio there and then go from there. So I see a student at NC, North Carolina. Um, I would assume it's not necessarily at you, it's but your central IT system. Um, I, so I, I will go off exactly what Alan said, just get in there and, and do a job because in your in IT in general, just to get that experience um, while you're rolling your way through um, school. As a professional, I lean on LinkedIn a lot. I do a lot of networking there um, and a lot of jobs posts there. Yeah, I was going to say, you will be surprised to, to learn that many of our leaders in the University Informational Technology Services, they started as student um, workers in the front line, answering uh, the questions from all the, the users at IU, and now they are VPs or managers or directors. So um, start there. Uh, you can ask also your, your professors for uh, also guidance on things that are open within their the department, but UITS will always have an open, some openings for students. So just, uh, you can just start from there. I would also add um, going into organizations once you get, well, once you're in as a, as a student and once you get out into the professional world, going into organizations that map to your values, because oftentimes you can find people who will be mentors, who will be sponsors, who will be people who will, will help you in your career and advise you in your career as well. So getting together with other like-minded folks can, can sometimes be extremely helpful as well. And I do, I do use LinkedIn all the time. I use, there are lots of jobs boards that are actually pretty good out there as well. I'm not just plugging mine, I'm plugging everybody else's <laughs> too, so, oh yes. All right, next. Oh. Go ahead, Miriam, I'm sorry. Uh, there's one more. Um, so there are certain groups that do um, freelance or they also have uh, groups of learning. There is one that is called um, Fire Basecamp, I think, I believe, or Basecamp, no. I'll, I'll post the, the link in, in here, but uh, they create groups across different uh, cities or even towns and they just uh, get together to build something for a nonprofit. And then from there, they start building their portfolio. And there are all, also people that will be seeking that talent within those groups and they will call them in. And, and that's a good way to also create your own community of, of practice. Mm -hmm. That's a great resource. It'd be great if you could throw that in the chat maybe at some point. Uh, next question. What is the biggest challenge that recent graduates face in the application process and the application pool? And then, by contrast, if you want to answer this as well, what challenges do seasoned IT professionals face when looking for new positions? Well, I can speak to probably the challenges uh, as an IT person now, and, and I'm actually working on it, and, and that is keeping up in certification. You can get really bogged down in working on your role and not uh, keep up to date with enterprise trends that are changing. 
So I'll put a plug out there. Uh, for example, this week was Microsoft Ignite. Uh, and something that they offer, uh, what's really great about what's happening during this pandemic is a lot of these IT conferences turning virtual. And I don't see restrictions on them. So to, to you, even if you're not in, uh, very aware of them, I would say check them out. Um, right now, Microsoft has something called a Cloud Skills Challenge that's happening through all of March. Um, you take one particular Azure uh, training track and they will give you a voucher for a free certification. But then again, I've got to do that on my own time, but, but that is probably one of my challenges. It's just making the time for training. So you never leave school, right, Ellen? <laughs> you think you're done. You're not. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I think standing out's hard um, for anyone, no matter where you are in your career. Because, I mean, there are a lot of jobs, but some of the job seeker or the, the people seeking employees want like um, perfection. And so maybe even trying to explain how you might be per not be the perfect fit right now, but, you know, you're learning, you're willing to go, you know, the for you're willing to continue to learn, right? And that kind of thing. So, I think those things kind of help you stand out too. I'm kind of going off what you were saying. What what kind of things can set applicants apart in the application process? What makes them stand out? I would just say um, the basics. I, I think that think very well about your cover letter. Uh, that's the first thing that will stand out rather. And, and I usually go first with the cover letter and then just check on the credentials because uh, they will tell me why they're interested about the position. They will tell me about a little bit of themselves. And also I will, I will, I'm looking for the voice and tone in that cover letter. Um, you know, if there are, I can, I can tell if there is someone that is uh, optimistic, positive, their, 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 their drive and, all the things that they want to offer and even um, add in the cover letter a little bit of what you have researched from the, from the business, from the company and highlight the things that you're interested in or, or that you found um, you know, right for your own fit. So I think that's the first connection that you will make with the company. So, so, so think very well about your cover letter. And I would say on the back end of that, if you get the interview, think very hard about your thank you note as well. Um, a lot of folks don't send one anymore. They just assume, you know, that, well, email's fine, but they just assume that they don't, doesn't need to be contact after the fact. And sometimes that contact after the fact is what gets you the job. You know, for instance, when I came into you, it's, I was actually interviewing for a completely different job. And when I thank them for the interview, they actually picked me up for another job because they thought I was better suited for that. So I didn't get the one job, but I got a different job because I was strong on that back end, basically. So, cause you wanna, you wanna start to have that connection with the people who interviewed you and sometimes you'll just impress them. And, and sometimes you could, you could sneak things in that you wanted to say in the interview that you didn't get to, or you forgot. <laughs> It's in the interview <laughs> it's the yeah. afterthought sometimes that really that really seals the deal mm -hmm. for a lot of people and so yeah I would agree with Miriam that the cover letter is great um, if you can make contact with the hiring manager before the interview that's also a plus sometimes that, sometimes you can do that with the HR person or the or the hiring manager not always but sometimes and then also like I said sealing the deal on the back end is really important yeah, one time that uh, someone really, uh, she got the job, but also because of her drive, um, this person called us the, the day before her interview to make sure that her connection was the right one. And even she wanted to test with us that her sound and her video was coming, on, coming in right. So right, right from there, we were thinking she's, at, she's really attend, uh, she puts attention to detail. So I think those those little details that that can make you stand out that those are very important. Yeah, there was a question in here about how to um, follow up and what that looks like. And I usually ask for email addresses, right? Normally you're in, especially now in a virtual, um, you know, 
invite and you will probably have some email addresses and I just use those myself. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have another question about asking for referrals. I assume this is talking about asking for references. Um, do you guys have any tips on how to approach that or how to have that conversation with a, a potential person you want as a reference? Um, I will throw in there that when I, I believe that when I went for my virtual engineer job, I went back to instructors from my field uh, that I did work in. So I didn't have enough, uh, like I went to the manager that I was working for, but it seemed like I just needed more of a range. So uh, I would say uh, create really good relationships with some of the faculty or instructors that you're connected with because those can serve as references as well. Just ask too, right? I know it's kind of in, you know, it's kind of daunting, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if you have someone that you know might put a good word in that's in the right field, don't be afraid. <laughs> Well, and I, I don't, I want to stress while you're in school, and this is something that I tell my college age son all the time, make those connections with your, with your faculty, with your teachers, with the people, you know, with the people who are helping you along the way, and they might actually become mentors, they might be willing to refer you for jobs, you know, don't just go to a class expecting you won't connect with the professor or with the teaching assistant or whoever it might be, you might find those connections very fruitful later on. And so, you know, my son loves his weather <laughs> classes. And so the professor was like all over him. He just wanted him to, you know, go into the, <laughs> go into environmental science for sure. And so, you know, if you can, if you can find somebody who shares your interests and who really wants to help you in your career, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And you can use that going forward for many years beyond your, your college years. Point. Yeah, I would say to join the mentorship program set, see what yes. offers, because that's a good way to get your coaching, your mentorship, and then that, that same person can write you a, a nice, it can be your referral and write you a nice, um, you know, some letter of reference or, or recommendation. Uh, Claire asks, what are some tips for building confidence before an interview? And I want to add on top of that, so many interviews are taking place via Zoom and phone now. Um, how does prepping for that look now? When I started at Salesforce, that's all they did. Um, anyhow, and it was before pandemic. Um, and I think it is that testing the connection beforehand, you know, that stuff is incredibly important for it. Um, I don't know that there's any really good way to prepare for an interview. I study a little bit, right? Like I'm, I'm coming in to be a scrum master and I've done it for a long time, but I don't, you know, put in my memory bank, you know, like I was trying to come up with this invest thing for, you know, breaking down stories in my other session. I was like, yeah, I Google that stuff. So I might like, so being remote, you can have a Google thing right beside you, right? You can have some like cliff notes and stuff. So I think there's an advantage to it. Well, I'd also say do your background, like don't have, don't show your, <laughs> if you can avoid it, don't show your house or, or anything in the background. Sometimes it ends up being pretty funny, but <laughs> it's not always the best to look for an interview. And I, I would also say practice with somebody else. Don't just study on your own. Don't just practice on your own. Actually go over everything with somebody who knows you and who knows your talents. That's a service that I provide to not only my, you know, not only to the people I know, but anybody who wants to contact me, I actually will go through, you know, everything with them and, and help them express themselves on, on the points that they want to make. And it's, it's great practice to, to be able to do that with somebody else. And, and I did this with a, with a friend of mine recently, and she got the job. And it was mainly because I reminded her of all the qualities that she has that match the job description, which she hadn't thought of. So like I said, having that sounding board is really important sometimes. Yeah, and, and look at some of the common interview questions. You can, you can find a lot of those lists and 
some of those questions you can you can think about the answers in a way of a story because people will remember the stories, not uh, just yet yeah, common answers. There's gonna be a lot of common answers to, to of course the common questions, right? But when you attach that to a personal story, people will remember that. I would say to, um, like Melanie said, just uh, ask a friend if they can, they can uh, practice uh, together with you. And also um, just, there's sometimes uh, when I go into an interview for a job, I, I uh, uh, play some music that will make me feel like upbeat. So I have some, uh, uh, some good selection of those um, just to help you feel like, like you got this, you feel upbeat. Um, you present that energy in your interview when, when you do that. And uh, confidence in yourself. I, and I feel like uh, it's a process, the whole thing with, in, with an interview and just finding the right person that you want to say, I want to work with you. Um, that's the first point. And also study the company so you can ask important questions about their projects or, or initiatives that they're rolling uh, out. That will, that will make you stand out also in the interview because you make your homework. You're, you're interested in the things that they're interested in, in the strategies. Um, also ask questions about, um, you know, how is, how is the team perceived across the, the company? So you can also learn if it's a good fit for you. And uh, finally, I would say, connect very much with yourself. Uh, know your strengths. Know that, that you are uh, willing to, to give yourself to this company. And uh, just, you, you just need to know what, what skills you're bringing to the table and also your strengths. So, so study those. Take time to connect with yourself. Uh, looks like we had another uh, question in the chat. How to respectfully follow up with recruiters if you don't hear back from them? Um, I'd almost piggyback off of what Melody mentioned earlier in just doing the uh, thank you letter. Um, to me, that's a really great way to follow up. Um, I guess uh, in terms of timing, I usually do like the one week, two week. Um, I don't know what uh, others think, but I, I would definitely just give it time because they have to get through a round of hiring. So sometimes I don't take the fact that they're not getting back at me um, as um, a reason for the job that I'm in. I think there, uh, there were so many organizational time uh, challenges. I, I were there were one month lapses uh, just dealing with finances and things like that. Um, I would just say don't push it too much, but uh, um, change your frequency, one week, two week type of follow up. Um. And I, I would also um, try to talk in the interview about the next steps, because then you'll know if, if you don't hear back within a certain period of time, then you probably, you know, and you follow up, but you don't hear back, you probably know that you are not the one selected for the job. And, and I think recruiters are trying to be more polite these days about actually telling you <laughs> one way or the other, but not always. And so I, I would say if, if they follow their next steps and then you don't hear anything, then I would move on to the next opportunity. So uh, Kelsey asks, do you have any advice for someone contemplating a career change? Well, I guess that depends on how big of a career change <laughs> we're talking about. Thing, or how old are you? And I hate to throw age in there, but, you know, because I, I, you know, I spent a decade helping my dad run a muffler shop straight out of, you know, high school. And I didn't start at IU until I was in my late 20s. You know, so I didn't start school until I was in my 30s. And then I kind of figured out what I wanted to do after that, you know. So I did a big career change. I think educating yourself in the place you want to change, trying to find links to people that are in that space to understand that space. Um, and I was in a session um, with um, Library Science not too long ago talking about um, some career changing and um, actually with Ivy Tech um, too. And um, you, you might use your SMEness, right? We talked about that a lot. So like I was in a car repair industry for 10 years, but now I want to switch to IT. Maybe I look for an IT company that does some car repair stuff, 
right? So that I can apply and I have some of those skills. Yes. She was clarifying that she's 30 and in nonprofit management. Gotcha. At this point. Yeah. But yeah, I think edu the education is important. I think the, the contacts are important. And I think being able to, um, you can still apply for technical jobs, even if you come from a different place, if you can show that your skills dovetail nicely with what they're looking for. Because there have been jobs in my life where I wasn't completely qualified. I didn't have all the IT skills or all, all of what I needed, but I had the skill set that they were looking for that could grow in the position. So it's not necessarily a no right out of the gate. You can, you can also try to see how to maneuver yourself with the skills you already have. Uh, would you guys say, just piggybacking off that question, maybe what skills you lack in that industry, can you make up for that a little bit or really try to shine a light on soft skills you have or like those transferable skills that might apply to the new position? Yeah, I, uh, well, in addition to the soft skills, when I look at the, the job description, I kind of try to group how much, like, or, um, example for experience. Sometimes it asks for a certain amount of customer service experience or, or whatnot. And I try to group and measure exactly how much experience I have in certain requirements in that role and see if there's ways to compensate for that. So if you're selling yourself uh, and showing that you're you're willing to learn, sometimes you may be able to talk about, you know, how are ways that I can compensate for what I don't know. And there are sometimes you never know when there's organizations that will train you what when you get there. Uh, so um, I think it's easy for us to feel that um, we're not that everything that that we see listed if we're not 100 percent really well in those fields we won't apply for it and i would just encourage you to push past that and to try it anyway yeah soft skills for me are very important when i am interviewing someone so in my questions i look for people that are good at teamwork that they're good at um, dealing with um, adversity or challenges or how they can be resilient. So I want to make sure that um, they will connect also with the, my current team. So soft skills are, are highly important for me more than you know, how much you know about programming because I have had superstars in programming but they cannot um, get along with the team or they, they just do things on them, uh, by themselves and they're not good at following you know, uh, guidelines or so to me, it's very important that you that, that you work on those things. You know how you know how how to make how to be resilient, how to be um, make connections, how to uh, deal with teamwork, and and all that kind of things. The emotional intelligence part of it, right? The yeah, and I think you know hard skills are easier to teach, and those are really hard to change. Mm -hmm. um, we had another question in the chat is there a resource that you would suggest for identifying what skills you actually have uh, this person finds that they believe they have value in their job but don't necessarily know what words to use to identify what they are good at or enjoy i want to point to mel in her suggestion about you know talking to someone and, and running through a mock you know what how, what you would say to somebody about why you want that job or what you're why you're qualified and having that person giving you that feedback yeah, I think, yeah. Oh, for sure. Sorry, Chris. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really good to have somebody else interpret for you because a lot of times uh, women especially play down their skills or they call themselves non-technical or they call themselves this or that. And it's not even close to being true. It's just that they have not had the chance to reflect enough to understand how their, you know, how their skills map to what's required in the job. They might have everything they need, but the, the words being used are not familiar words. And maybe somebody just has to say, well, what they're actually asking for is this, and you have this because you do X every day. So these are the things that I think it's, it's critical, cr uh, critical to have feedback for. Yes, there's also the book Strength Finder. 
they will give you a code and then you can, uh, it's, a, it's a survey or you know, a list of questions and they will give you your top five strengths. And people do it all the time in UITS and across the IU system, just to make sure that you know, uh, in, in your career development, um, that's a that's a book that is recommended a lot. I keep my strengths handy. I actually have a little fold up behind me <laughs> yeah. from where we with Mel, <laughs> yeah. where we've done some, you know, some of that. And I just remind myself too of those on a daily basis. These yeah. these are your strengths, girl. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that. well, yeah, and I think the the new mindset is to try to play to your strengths instead of trying to bolster your weak your weaknesses because you might not be as strong in some areas, but you're very strong in others. And so try to find positions or jobs or whatever that, that enhance those strengths and that play to those strengths, because you will always be effective in those roles. Just wanted to unmute and say thank you guys. Um, I said to thank you in the chat, but I, this was so helpful because I job bounced my whole twenties and now I found where I want to be but I can't express what I'm good at, you know, because to me, I'm like, this is just what I like to do, but I don't have an ability to say, this is why I'm good at what I do. So thank you so much. I can tell you what, uh, Rachel, you're good at being assertive. <laughs> so that's one. <laughs> um, okay, so another question that I had is, I wanted to talk about networking in the age of COVID, it's all virtual now for the most part. Um, what does that look like? Do you guys have any tips for navigating virtual networking events or anything like that? Because I would think it's a little bit different than in, in person. That's gotta be hard, like to start out right now. <clears throat> Cause I networked um, in my like meetups in that type of thing. But I think you can still try to attend some virtual events in the, uh, you know, the meetup is a great space. It's a great space to kind of look for, you know, events. And, and actually, since they're all virtual, it's actually kind of nice. I'm connecting with people in California and Florida, and, you know, it's some meetups. I'm attending like California Agile meetups. I would have never attended something like that, you know, if it weren't all virtual. So you try to use it to your advantage, but it's also kind of rough. There is also um, a meetup that is called Girl Develop IT, and that goes also by chapters. So there's one in Indianapolis and Chicago and different places, and they will connect you with uh, bigger companies. So they have, for example, in Chicago, the, the meetups are in, um, in um, Groupon, for example, or they have had in, in different companies. So they actually, make those connections and, and you can do coffee, you know, virtual uh, connections. And, and sometimes they have also events to prepare you to an interview or they can prepare you to uh, do some JavaScript or coding or whatever you might need. They are really good and I highly recommend those. It's Girl Develop IT. Um, I just wanted to say for virtual networking, if you can, if you can find spaces that there are both men and women in IT, I think that's, that's highly valuable because, because a lot of the leadership in IT across the United States is predominantly men. And so if you, if you are always in all women networking sessions, you may not meet the people that you need to meet to, to uh, move your career forward for instance. So, and then once you get into leadership, then you can change the game there. But until that happens, <laughs> it's, it's good to have a mixed group and to, to have the men see you as a strong woman in IT who, whom they want to hire, whom they want to, to move up the ladder, basically. So I don't have a, an answer from experience, but um, I know that Another organization I'm in uh, started using Eventbrite when things went virtual to post their events. And we started getting people from the UK, from Canada, from places we didn't expect for them to show up. 
Uh, so searching LinkedIn and searching Eventbrite and selecting what your uh, options or what you're looking for are, are just so much easier to do. Um, I know that in our organization, we welcomed people who, you know, would be difficult to follow up with afterwards. We still welcome them to kind of join our community and learn what was to be offered. So I would encourage that um, as well. Just jump into those um, open virtual sessions. Yeah, I've been loving the free conference registrations all over the place. I mean, I've attended so many great conferences virtually, so that's, it's a great opportunity. All right, the final question I have before we can open it up into a Q&A is, um, do you guys have any tips or recommendations for continuing your education as you progress in the field? I think Ellen hit it earlier when she talked about certifications. Mm -hmm. Um, those are always ever changing and ever evolving. Yeah. Lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you have a career path in mind, it's good to prepare for that as soon as you can, because it might take you a while for, to get from here to there. And so it could be education. It could be meeting some people who are going to teach you how to do the job as, as your mentor or sponsor, it could, there could be a lot of avenues toward your next move. And although a lot of us have had a windy road to get to where we are today, that doesn't mean that it has to happen for you <laughs> too, because a lot of, you know, um, for well, Chris and I back in the day, you know, computers weren't that much of a thing <laughs> when we were in high school, for instance, and now they are. So it's, um, I think it's a better scenario almost for you for you coming up today uh, in college because you might have a, a good idea of what your career path might be and how to get from here to there. So um, yeah. I would say learn everything you can basically and find where your interests lie. Sorry, Waring, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say yes, uh, certifications, books. But I would say also learn from your experiences, learn from adversity. Uh, every time that there is a challenge, after you have overcome it, over, overcome it, overcome it <laughs> uh, you have to intentionally think, what did I learn from this? And that will, um, and, and what can I take ahead of like in the, in the next opportunity? What can I use from this? Because it's always adversity that makes us stronger. Um, I remember in the 2000 um, when the web bubble uh, burst and I lost my job. And from that at first, I, was, I lost my job. I was pregnant. My husband was uh, a, a, a student still. <laughs> so we were like in a pickle there. But, um, you know, I, I started freelancing and that gave me confidence that I could do things by myself. I didn't need a boss or a company. I could do it myself. So that was to me uh, uh, a very good example that you have to learn from anyone, anything, any, any situation and, and books, just, just uh, there's a lot of free resources in the internet. So uh, find a mentor, uh, learn from them. Just, you know, those, learn from everything you can. <laughs> That's my advice. All right, if anybody has any questions, comments, things they want to share, we can open up the floor to just an open dialogue or ask the panelists questions, whatever you guys would like. Something I thought about in some of the other questions was um, you may not always get the exact job you want to start with. And it's something I tell people um, with agility and, you know, I want to be on a scrum team and I want to be a scrum master. And, you know, I didn't start out as a scrum master. I started out, you know, as a, a business analyst on the team and learning. So it, it goes back to that learning, but it also is, you know, it may not be the exact role immediately, but eventually keeping the eye on the, the goal. I would also say um, when you're getting into the interview and stuff, ask a lot of questions, show a lot of interest. 
Um, the mistake a lot of people make is they just kind of let the information come to them and then they answer the questions that they're asked, but then they don't ask about the company. They don't take note of things like is, you know, am I being interviewed by a committee of diverse individuals from diverse backgrounds, et cetera? You know, there are warning signs to things, you know, if it's all white males who are interviewing you, there are warning signs to the culture in the company and stuff. And, you know, there, there are things that you should always notice and ask about when you're in the interview situation. And I think we have questions, Carl, so we can go to yep. those. Uh, Ariana asks, how do you get through the submitted and online application phase where they may have gotten hundreds of applicants, especially as more AI are being used by large companies in their hiring process? Um, I'm, I was just thinking of a, a part of this question and that is uh, make sure that um, like during a time when you're applying at a lot of jobs, Take the time to customize that resume for the job that you are applying for, uh, because those are going to hit keywords. If it's generalized, it may get missed. I've seen this ha happen as we brought in uh, consultants for our, you know, it'll just it'll just drop them out. So definitely uh, do not generalize your resumes. Make them cater to the job you're applying for. Also, um, you can put some design on your um, the materials that you're sharing. Your cover letter it can have a, a logo. It can have something that you made yourself, or something that you can access from um, from a stock photo, or just make it you know standing out. And also the the CV or the resume. I think that it's it's um, something that is pleasing for them to see, something that they can scan easily because uh, it's not just a list of all the things that you have, it's, it's how you prepare it in a piece of paper and what are you highlighting of yourself? What are my strengths uh, over here in the left corner and in the right corner, I'm gonna put just uh, you know my, my experience, but then I also am gonna put what I have volunteered for or in the scale of one to 10, how strong I feel about these skills. And you can present them in a way that they can, they can just see it right away. And, and uh, that will stand out very much. So, so put some design and, and just think about how people, uh, after seeing so many resumes for a couple of hours, they can just find yours and scan it in a few seconds and say, this person, I wanna interview this person. Yeah, I think in IT too, you get so many just, you know, standard, just, you know, tech. Oh my gosh. And it's just like, but I also have had, so you, you, you say, I've also had people that have like put like their glamour shot on there and that one went to the wayside too. So, you know, you can go a little overboard on one side, but, but definitely do something because gosh, the, the stock resumes get old to look at. <laughs> well, I always put my LinkedIn profile and my portfolio. Mm -hmm. on my resume because if you want to stand out if you have work that you've done that that shows your aptitude for the job that you're applying for that you should always have that available for somebody to pull down and look at if especially if it's a visual thing to to pull down and look at it essentially and um the other thing i would say is just to answer a question that i saw pop up it, if you can put your interests and your extracurricular activities in there or work them in somehow um, especially if they apply to the job <laughs> that you're, that you're applying for. Um, that's to me, it makes you a human being. It, it makes you, you know, not a cardboard person. You, it makes you a human being and, and well-rounded. So I like, I like seeing that on the resumes for sure. Also on the, uh, act, uh, the questions to ask to the interviewer, make sure that you read the job description and ask them, what is the, what is priority on these skills that you're asking? for mm -hmm. what will be the day today um what does a day look like uh for a person that will get this job and what interactions they will have with other teams so that that means that you read the job description and you're already thinking about what will make a difference for the employer uh in your job and and what are they looking for what are the expectations um what are they expecting for you to to achieve in the first month or in the in three months, what will be the expectation? So those things also help you, you know, get answers from from the employer and see if you are really interested in that in that job. 
And I would say to build on that, um, I would ask them what qualities from my resume made you select me for an interview in the first place? Because that can get right to the point <laughs> sometimes. Um, do you guys have any other uh, tips on what kind of questions you should be asking interviewers during your interview? I would say, what are the current challenges for the for the that you are um, you know com, um, that you have right now? Um, I'm gonna let the other the other um, participants just uh, ask more questions, and, and I think that Melanie and Chris was were gonna say something. Sorry. Well, I would just spot out why are you hiring this? Maybe even add that right. Why you know understand the 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 history of that position a little bit. Yeah. Hi, um, I want to know, like, how do you ask, like, about the culture? Because sometimes what the company portrays itself online might not be, you know, what it is. But, and also in an interview, it might not be, like, enough information that they're giving you. Like, how do you, like, research on that? I do a lot of online research. Glassdoor is pretty good, but people can monitor that too, right? Companies cannot let stuff go out or do let some stuff go out, but just doing some Google searches, I think will help. It's really hard to get that out in an interview. You're right. I don't know. Anybody else have any good? Sometimes you can note things about the company from the environment and from the interview committee, et cetera. So um, I always encourage people to to kind of ask pointed questions. You know, if you want to ask about, um, you know, uh, <laughs> it's hard to put this the best way, but you, you want to ask about the demographics of the organization that you're working for. If it's important to you to have, you know, to have diverse perspectives, you know, you want to make sure that you're working with all kinds of people, not just the same type of person all the time. So it's um, it's kind of key when you're noticing things to, to ask. And you can be as subtle as or as direct as you want, because you don't want to make the mistake of starting to work for a company that's going to be lying to you from the get go, or that's going to make you feel like you don't belong in that environment. So, Use your network, right? Yeah, exactly. To, to understand. Like I work at Salesforce right now and I, I've been trying to work at Salesforce for, you know, four years because just the, 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 you know, what the company, you know, their reputation in general. And I, you know, and I had talked to people that had worked there and I knew that their reputation was actually what they said it was. Yeah. You can beg your daughter to refer you, which is what <laughs> I do. <laughs> I just follow my daughter everywhere. Will you refer me to this job? <laughs> so I, oh. Go ahead, Ellen, please. No, I was just reflecting. It might go back to what we were saying earlier about, um, you know, just as you ask someone about details about the job description, what's the priority of this particular section? If you look um, at what they're presenting online and you're curious to learn more to understanding, then put that on the line because you're just asking for more interpretation or insight on how they feel about, you know, the way that that's really projected. So if they, and I mean, I think a lot of uh, places are coming out with more diversity and inclusion initiatives. And so you can see it's, it's easier to see some of that and just, you know, speak on it if that's important to you. All right, we had one last quick question in the in the chat. Is it okay to ask who your direct coworkers would be? I would, oh. No, no, go ahead, Ellen. Yeah. Um, sometimes, um, I, would, I would start at least with knowing who's in the panel. Uh, who's in the, like, a lot of times, the interviews that I've sat in on, there are, three plus people in the room doing the interview. So try to understand, you can try to, if you don't know how to get, um, if you don't wanna ask who my direct workers are, if that's asking too much information, just learn more about the people in the room with you. And if any of them 
will be part of the network of people that you would connect with. And I guess in, in my, you know, what I do is I always have the interviewees meet the team from the get go, because I want to see the dynamic of, of how they're all interacting together and how they solve problems together. Because usually what I do is I pose a problem to the, to the interviewee and, uh, and let them try to figure it out and then watch the, watch the rest of the team kind of help them out and what questions the interviewee asks of the team. And do they seem to be working well with one another, essentially? All right, well, we ran a little bit over our time. That, you guys all asked such great questions. Thank you for your participation this afternoon. And panelists, thank you for your time. Uh, very insightful. I did want to plug real quick before we all hop off. IUWIT is sponsoring a speed networking session at three o'clock. So here in about seven minutes, and we would love to see you all there. Uh, it should be super fun and you'll have the opportunity to meet a lot of uh, different people. So I hope everybody has a great afternoon. And again, thank you panelists and thank you attendees. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you. Good luck. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you in a little while. <laughs> thank you. Good job, guys. Thank you. <laughs>